All right. Well, thank you, Margo, for being on Tea Time with the Teacher. Um, how's it going? It's good. Um, yeah. I mean, as good as it can be with everything going on right now. So. Yeah. So what's what's kind of, I guess, talk us through like a, a normal day, a normal school day like today? Um, well, Wednesdays, actually, we don't have any meetings because it's asynchronous learning. And I think it's really nice to have a break from staring at a computer screen all day. But a typical day, I wake up a lot later than I do for actual school, which is nice. Uh, and then we, we eat breakfast. Me and my siblings all do school in the same room. I think it helps us focus. We all use headphones, so. Uh, and then I have a class, one class before lunch. Each of my classes periods are one hour long. Then I eat lunch. Uh, and then I have some more asynchronous learning to complete assignments. Then I have two more classes, and then two hours after that for more work. And then the school day's done. Dang. Uh, what about outside? Are you, do you guys have your own little pods or, or some friends you can hang out with? Or is it, is it uh, keeping it as, as tight as possible? Everything is remote. I mean, I, I'm doing Science Olympiad this year. So I do Zoom calls with my friend to study. And then I do some online extra art classes. But, oh, and I'm also in a book club, but that's really it. That sounds, I, I'm so glad that you're doing things outside of just the tradition, you know, I guess, because that, I mean, I teach it and it's, it's, I can't imagine being on the other side of it yeah. um, without having anything extra. Cause usually it's like sports or clubs or friends or lunch, you know? Um, so what's, I guess, thinking back so far, what's like been maybe a lesson or an activity or something that your teacher may have done in, in online class that actually worked? I know they're probably more boring lessons, uh, but is there anyone trying something like new that you think is pretty cool? Um, um, yeah. Well, we have this whiteboard thing where, okay, it's a Microsoft thing and you, kind of, you can put up sticky notes onto it and all of the entire class can write stuff on there. I think it's a lot less chaotic than it would be in the actual classroom because everybody would be swarming the board and that's just kind of awkward to maneuver your way through there. Um, I think my art teacher ha has had to be really creative. <laughs> I mean, it's mainly just doing art and then taking pictures, which works actually surprisingly well, but hmm, yeah. Yeah. So, well, the fact that it's hard to think, I think, shows how, you know, difficult it is to, to transition. Um, but thinking about it, I mean, you're, you have like your, I mean, your dad's very techy, and you're in an area where, so do you think that there's any, anything that we could take away from this whole experience that like, when you go back into your normal classroom, you would like to see stay or do would you think like hey this has all been garbage um we should let's just you know go full because for me it's like i guess grading online assignments are much easier to grade and to track the progress and stuff so um is there anything that that you think tech has allowed us to um okay so teams has this assignments thing and that, honestly okay this may seem weird but i love it because it, it has the list of assignments that you have to do and you don't have to write it down. You can just click turn in, then boom, it's turned in and the teacher can grade it and it's pretty great. Uh, I think keeping that would be nice, but I feel like it would be strange to work around being face to face with the teacher and being like, and having teams on the side. Yeah. I'm, First, because, you know, because I teach social studies, keeping the, all the notes from the whole year, remembering all that information, you know, very few people actually keep the notes for the whole year. Whereas now you're right, they're all cataloged there. So come end of the year, they'd be able to just, you know, I can post the answer key to the notes at the end of class and they can, you know, look at it on their own or whatever. Have you noticed just like with your classmates, is it, you know, like, 
everyone's engaged and answering questions in synchronous time? Or do you see kind of like a wide range, depends on the students, depends on the class? Um, well, I'm, I'm with the same group of students for most of my classes. And there's a few kids who are really, really engaged and they're like, I know the answer, I know the answer. And they turn on their videos. The other kids, it's like, it's like they're not there. But I think I kind of hover in between. I answer questions, but especially in the morning when I'm really tired, it's hard to turn on your camera. And be like, hi, I just woke up. And welcome to the inside of my house or, yeah. or whatever. How about, how about your siblings? Are they, since they're younger, have their, have, have teachers adapted it to younger ages or is it kind of just like, Hey, hopefully, even though you're younger, you can focus for eight hours or whatever. Um, well, my mom has been helping my little sister a lot, Coco. She's in second grade. Um, my brother is really, really engaged, uh, which yeah, I think the younger kids in general are engaged. When I look over at their screens, almost all of the kids have their cameras on. I think it makes a little bit of sense because middle schoolers are like nearly teenagers and teenagers like to sleep a lot. And I guess, yeah. And I think it's easier for younger kids to be more engaged because they're, hmm, because I feel like they're, they are a lot more enthusiastic about it because it's new and it's exciting and small kids like exciting things. Yeah, it's, it's, it stinks because I feel like there's like an expectation that when you get older, school becomes this boring, boring thing. Because um, I, you know, when I was in elementary school, I feel like I enjoyed school. But then later it just became like, a chore. So I, I wish it became something that you just continue to like learn what interested you with engaging stuff rather than I think there's the expectation that like when you go to middle school and high school, it's just going to be like, here's the information. And, you know, you got to learn all these things rather than like, do you actually enjoy what's going on? Um, but so enough about school specifically, but um, I, I just want to I think about my own struggles um, and the struggles that teachers have in um, like getting students who may not share out in your traditional hand raise sharing out. Um, and I want to think specifically in a normal circumstance. So, you know, in a normal school year, um, so not virtually or whatever. So what would you tell teachers or what advice would you give teachers to make sure students, all students, have a chance to share and feel heard rather than, as your story references, and we'll get into that, the jar of doom? Um, okay, so I don't know about other kids, but for me personally, I don't like talking over people. It makes me feel really awkward and ugh. So... I like more structured discussions where the teacher kind of is like, uh, Margo, would you like to talk instead of being, instead of it being popcorn style, like whoever wants to talk, just talk loudly, and tell us what you want to say. Uh, I think s s there's always that one kid who dominates the class, takes up way too much airtime it makes it a lot harder for quieter students to talk when that other person is talking. How do you feel, thank you for saying that, how do you feel about, you know, kind of like your story mentions, you know, a teacher is asking for an answer, you know, any volunteers and, you know, no one wants to volunteer. Do you think like for us, you know, the popsicle stick, you know, you pull a popsicle stick and you call on some stage. How do you feel about that? or for maybe students who may be on the quieter side. So it's not like they don't know the answer. They just, you know, get some butterflies and get a little nervous when, when sharing whole group. Do you, do you think that works or is there like a different way that could better reach those students? Um, I mean, 
I know I get really nervous when I have to talk in front of a large group of people. I think I talk a lot more in small groups, like group work, but that those have a whole bunch of issues. Uh, I feel like, I mean, splitting off into smaller groups to discuss things would get, would work a lot better in, uh, in what's it called, in normal school rather than online school where people can just hide behind their camera, not be there. Because I, I think the struggle for teachers is they want to just make sure that every student like knows the answer, for example. Um, so sometimes I think that if a student doesn't want to answer a question, then, you know, the perception is that they don't know the answer. Whereas I think, you know, your story really highlighted the fact that there can be different ways to get students to feel comfortable. Um, so do you think like when, when you need to show an answer, do you prefer writing it? Do you prefer like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the teacher? What, you know, what is, you know, what would you, cause this, this is mainly for teachers and I, I wanna make sure that teachers know that the Margos of the world or the other students of the world who are bright and know the answer but just don't want to, or don't feel comfortable sharing it in your traditional way, but there's still a way to have them participate and do in what makes them feel comfortable. So what would be your ideal, you said small groups, but is there anything else that a teacher could do or a classroom could be like that would make you feel like, wow, I can share and it feels good? Um, like you said, I think writing down the answers is nice because like I said, I get very jittery when I have to talk and everybody's staring at me and I don't want to mess up. But when I write it, when I, I feel like if kids could write it down, they wouldn't have to worry as much about messing up. Yeah, I think we use, I've been starting to use Nearpod um, and it's, it's like a different software that um, you know, it's like engaging, you can have little activities on the computer and stuff. And it's cool because you can do like discussion boards where students can like post. So we did like, what three items would you take to a desert island? And then students can just post. Um, and what I've seen is 50% more of students are answering because I'm not just like, all right, Margo, unmute. What's, what three things would you take? And then it's like, someone's not even there. I don't know if you have that problem, but like the student's not even there. So then there's just silence and it's like, all right, whereas this way I could see everyone. And then I see the students who may not share out, they may like not answer, but then they're all over the collaboration board and they're all over the writing. So it's like, you know, I want to go back to a normal school and still find those ways to, to make sure students can share out and their voices are heard. Um, because I think a teacher asked me the other day, how do I make sure that all my students feel heard instead of just the same three or four that may dominate the conversation? Hmm. Well, yeah, we have the, you know, the chat feature in Teams, that's really helped. But as a way to transfer that over to normal school, hmm, I think that, I mean, it's possible. I know I really like surveys, forms, because uh, when the te my teacher, my English teacher, she asks for feedback a lot. And I think I, I like those forms. I f I'm not sure if it would be as easy to use those in normal school, but I think, Hmm. May, oh, oh yeah. Last year, this isn't, it wasn't as like, it wasn't. Okay. So my English teacher last year, she had this board where you could take a sticky note, put something up there and everybody and you, and it was anonymous and people could see it. Uh, she used it for book recommendations, but I think other teachers could use it for different things. I like that. I like that. So kind of segueing into that, 
let's talk about your short story. Um, I'm going to link it in, in, in the podcast as well, but where did you, where did you come up with this idea? What inspired you to kind of send this theme and send this message out to, to your audience? Well, I mean, the butterfly effect has always been really cool. I've, I've always been a little bit fascinated by it. Dad told me about it a while ago. Um, and I think it's really cool how so the future can just depend on one little thing. Uh, and actually, my story evolved a lot, but I ended up writing the small story inside of the story first. But I thought it was too short and it needed more explanation. So I ended up writing something to fit around it. And I drew so much in inspiration from my own life. Like I do have an annoying little sister who goes into my room without permission, but <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So what, what were you like, what was, if you could, for someone reading it to take one theme or message away from the story, what would you hope that they learn? Like you, I guess, you know, when you're reading a book, it's like the, the moral of the story or whatever. Hmm. Um, I, I hope that they take away that. <clears throat> that just because something, somebody isn't out there, somebody isn't really loud and crazy and we, they still have things to say and they, they're people too. I like that. The detail that you put into the story, the imagery, um, I think, I mean, how many books are you reading? You you must be a, a bookworm um, and just be reading all the time. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think I read a little bit too much, but... <laughs> What's... My mom says I should get my head out of book out of my book sometimes. But... Oh my god! Tell her she needs to read more. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'll tell her that you don't tell her that. Um, what's I, I'd put this in? What's a book or what's an author? Since you're probably an expert, that people maybe like one of your one of your good reads that maybe other people don't know about. It could be a book like um, for other students your age, or just a book in general that you think, or an author that you think people should check out. Um, well, I just read The 10,000 Doors of January uh, by Alex C. Harrow, and I, I really liked it. It was kind of, it was actually kind of like my own story. It, two stories were going on at once. Uh, the character was reading the story while having her own adventure. And I really liked it because the author described words that she, the author described words as pictures. And I really like that. I think that shows in your, in your short story. I can see your author style. You'd like the way in which you write is, is, I know, you know, I don't want to pigeonhole you now, but is that something that you would want to, I mean, you're off to a great start. Is that something you would want to pursue, you know, in college or, you know, beyond? Um, I love writing. I feel like if I, I, if I could be an author, that would be amazing. I think no matter what I do, no matter what I end up doing, I'll probably always be writing on the side. But and if I become an actual author, author, well, I'll be writing all the time. That's awesome. No, I'm excited. I mean, if you're writing this at, how old are you? 12, turning 13 in like a month. You're, you're 12. And I think the audience listening to this, if they haven't read the story, they will, they will, if I, if I told them, if I didn't tell them the age of the person, I, I think they would, they would be blown away that, that you're 12 going on 13. Um, I've had a couple students on before, never your age, but, and I always ask them, going through right now is, is difficult for a lot of students, especially in, you know, low-income communities or maybe with parents that 
may not be able to help them either because they don't know what's going on or because they're just busy with, with work. So for a student maybe your age who's struggling to stay engaged or is kind of getting really burnt out from school, what would, like, what could be your advice or maybe some words of, of encouragement to get them through? Because hopefully we're, all, we're almost there. Um, but what would you tell them to, I guess, keep them, keep them going and, and things that maybe have worked for you to stay mentally, it's probably, I mean, books, I'm sure is one of them, but is there anything else that, you know, you would recommend to, to stay strip, you know, secure and, and somewhat sane? Uh, I think I've picked up some extra hobbies. Those have helped me, like I've started playing guitar again. Uh, I also think that something everybody should remember is that everybody is trying their best and don't get frustrated because it's not like people are holding back on purpose. They're all, they're all trying and yeah, I guess you should try too. So on to a lighter note, I want you to think back to outside of coronavirus and all that stuff in your classroom through your experience, funniest moment or most impactful moment or both with either a teacher or in a classroom. Okay, so this, this, this one thing happened a while back in first grade and it has traumatized me. <laughs> uh, it's kind of silly, but I misspelled enjoy with an, and I put an I instead of an E. And I was writing even back then, which is kind of crazy. But <laughs> I mean, it, I think I was so horrified back then, but now it's just kind of funny how upset I was about that one little thing. Um, but a more impactful thing would be last year, I was a little bit confused about stuff happening in class. I forget which class. So I emailed my teacher and I was so nervous because I didn't want to be annoying or a bother. But the teacher was so nice when she responded and I was kind of shocked and really happy. So now I think because of that, I email my teachers a little bit more than I would have if I had if that hadn't happened. Not too much, I hope. No, not no. too much. No, there's no such thing as too much. Coming from the teacher's perspective, you you now have you know family access to a teacher. Um, that is what we that is what we do the job for. It's for people who. Like we would much rather you sending an email than the hundreds of emails we have to send saying, you know, they didn't do their work or whatever. Oh, so the fact that you're reaching out saying, hey, I don't understand this. Can you help me? That's really what gives us energy. So continue. Um, and if anything, this is just advice for anyone. It puts you on the teacher's radar, you know, as far as like, if you have an 89 or, you know, if you have a, a B plus or something, it's like, I know you're putting in the effort because you found my email and you emailed me. So I'm going to do everything to, to help you, you know, support you and, and also get the, get the grade or whatever it may be that you want, because I know you're showing the, the effort. So keep doing it. Um, even when you go to high school and college, um, it's definitely a best practice to, to continue like advocating for yourself because I mean, I care about all my students, but it's not like I don't forget sometimes where everyone is at because there's just, there's just so many of them. Um, and then the last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was just um, parents. Um, I think, you know, when we think about parents, especially now it's, it's really difficult. Um, so what have your parents done that, that you really value that's worked? And then maybe something that you would, I guess, hope to see more of, more from them, if anything. Um, well, my dad works and my mom is the one who kind of keeps us all focused and stuff. Uh, 
she, at the beginning of the year, I was doing my classes in my room, but then I wasn't focusing. And she was like, Margo, you have to come out of your room and come do school with us over here. And I think that really helped me. I was focusing more and yeah. Mm, I think, I think it for parents in general, just because the student says they're doing something does not mean they're actually doing it. <laughs> and like, if they go into their room and say, oh yeah, I'm totally studying for two hours. I think the parents should try and touch base. Like maybe my mom, she knocks on my door once in a while and is like, Margo, are you doing what you wanna be doing? And I think that helps me reset and get back in a better mindset. It's crazy that you said kids are not always doing what they say they're doing. Um, because last week I had the situation where um, this parent had reached out because their kid wasn't, you know, necessarily doing well in school in my class. Um, and we had a day where there was like a case, you know, close contact, because we're kind of in person some. And um, so all the kids went virtual, which was a tough transition for a lot of them to, you know, within a day go back. Um, and she was on the call, but she wasn't doing any of the work. So it's like, you know, some kids, they just log on and then they just say, all right, I'm going outside to play sports or whatever. Um, and I had, we had an assignment and she wasn't doing it. So then the parent emailed me and she said, well, why does my daughter have a low grade? And I said, well, she, she was on the call, but she didn't do the work. And then she was, I guess, really offended. And I don't know if she, I think she was, I think she was mad at me, but I think it was more because she was really mad at her kid tricking her. Um, well, hopefully you don't do that. But because um, she said, I went into her bedroom and I said, are you doing your work? Are you on the call? And she said, yes, mom. And then she walked out. And then I talked to the student in person this week. And I said, your mom came into your room and said that you were doing your work. And she's like, oh, yeah, I wasn't doing my work, but I didn't want her to know. So I just lied. And I wasn't even mad because I was like, I've been your age, I would have done the exact same thing. So I was like, it's almost the parent to say, hey, turn your laptop around. Let me actually see what you're doing because I don't trust you because of course you would lie if I caught you in a lie or if I knew that you weren't doing, you're not gonna say, hey mom, I wasn't doing my work. You know, I'll take whatever punishment you give me. Yes, ma'am, no ma'am, that's never how it works. And if that's the case, then you're the best child ever. Um. Um, I think that sometimes kid parents have to remember that the kid isn't trying to be lazy and they shouldn't get too upset because that makes the kid want to lie more because they don't want the parent to get upset at them. <laughs> yeah, we can do another episode on just things to tell parents not to do from the perspective of a kid. Because I think oftentimes there's no like outlet for kids to like share to parents what they, you know, it's like a teacher. Sometimes I'm like, here's the lesson. I'm the greatest teacher ever. Be quiet. You know, whereas I love that your teacher does feedback and is always asking for surveys and input and all that stuff. And when you think about it, it makes the teacher better and it makes the classroom better. Um, so you would hope that with parents too, they're constantly trying to say, oh, well, you know, Marco really likes it when I do this. So let me try and do that more. Or she likes when I knock before I come in because it's an intrusion of her privacy or, or you know, whatever it may be, you're nodding your head. So like, yes. Um, because as a parent too, I would want to make sure that I would, you know, want to do things that you wanted, um, especially if you weren't, like you didn't tell me straight up, you know, so to give a voice to other students or other kids who, uh, may not be able to tell their parent, but maybe their parent hears it from you. And then they're like, oh, wait, I do that to my kid. Maybe they get really upset when I do that. Um, but that's all I had. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to link your short story. I think it's amazing. Um, good luck. I, I think you're, is it you're going to state, right? Yeah, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> don't be, don't be. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is, I'm sure, one of many future stories that we're that we're going to see and hear from you. Um, 
and thank you so much for for taking the time and and speaking um yeah thank you